Okay, thank you, everybody. We have a, a double bill today, and we're starting the program with Lynette Locke, who comes from the National University of Singapore. She did her early work there as part of a PhD, looking at, I guess what you'd call it, ecological engineering, how you alter man-made structures in order to promote biodiversity, particularly on what we would traditionally regard as fairly anthropogenic surfaces, concretes, etc. And the idea is to help ameliorate the effects of, of humans on the environment. She's continued that work, uh, successfully completed her PhD, and is now a postdoctoral work, worker at the same university. And we have to thank MASTS for providing the funding to bring Lynette over here to work with colleagues in Glasgow and also interact with the rest of the MAS network. So, Lynette, you're welcome, and we're keen to hear your talk. Thanks, Dave. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming along this afternoon. Um, so my talk will be about enhancing biodiversity on tropical seawalls. And this will essentially be a synthesis of my main research over the last four years of uh, my PhD. So, as you know, the world's coastlines are becoming increasingly urbanized and altered by climate change. Um, so, this trend is likely to continue, as it's predicted that by the next decade, three quarters of the world's population will reside in coastal zones. In, addi in addition to the rapid pace of such developments, the risk of accelerated sea level rise, more frequent and intense storms and floodings uh, have been predicted to um, increase. As a result, seawalls and other man-made coastal defenses are quickly becoming the primary means of mitigating such risk on a global scale. Singapore is a good example of this. Most of its, shore, its shorelines have been replaced by seawalls, which cover approximately 63% of the coastline and will probably increase with further reclamation. However, despite this proliferation, relatively few studies have examined these double habitats. As a habitat, however, seawalls differ from natural shores in some fundamental ways. Some of the more obvious ones include vertical steepness, differences in materials, altered hydrodynamics, as well as reduced structural complexity, all of which can have a huge influence on what actually lives on or can live on them. And it's important to note that um, relative to what we know of temperate rocky shores, for example, um, tropical rocky shore ecology, um, I mean rocky shore ecology in tropical Southeast Asia is virtually non-existent. So this is what a typical seawall in Singapore looks like. And although their impacts are obvious and they do not support the kind of diversity one would expect at the seashore, there's a growing realization that because these seawalls cannot be removed, there is a need to look beyond their negative impacts to recognize their potential for the conservation of coastal biodiversity and to find ways in which seawalls can be built to increase their value as a habitat while serving its utilitarian function. So, in other words, ecological engineering, as David mentioned, and this is a flow diagram I came up with to categorize some of the mitigation strategies that can be adopted for the different kinds of coastal habitats in Singapore. As you can see here, um, seawalls or other man-made coastal defenses can be ecologically engineered in many ways. However, for existing seawalls that cannot be removed, increasing their habitat complexity still remains one of the most viable approaches. So my research began with trying to increase complexity um, of seawalls uh, and to look at its effects on the biological communities living on seawalls. However, upon a comprehensive literature review, I quickly realized that complexity is often poorly defined. And while there exist many different measures of complexity in the field, um, there is, for example, factor dimensions. There is no way to convert or translate these numbers meaningfully into actual substrates. For example, it doesn't make sense to convert a factor dimension number into a concrete tile, which is why many studies using artificial substrates uh, and testing complexity often measure complexity retrospectively. 
But such an approach often overlooks key variables such as spatial arrangement and surface area. So I came up with a framework to define and manipulate complexity. Um, this conceptual framework essentially categorizes ecological complexity into two fundamental forms, system space and information-based complexity, which can be simply thought of as two different ways of looking at movie reel. So over time, or at a fixed time point, and essentially we can only physically manipulate at a fixed time point, or we can only physically manipulate informational complexity, although subsequent dynamic processes will undoubtedly occur. So it's important to operationally define informational complexity as it comprises many variables, of which the numerical ones are listed here. And it's important to separate them so that we can understand their independent and relative effects. For example, many um, studies often do not account for density in their studies, so that greater number of species observed in more complex habitats could simply be due to greater surface area sample. And as you know, um, species area relationship is a pretty robust law in ecology. So with this framework, I then created a software tool called CASU for creating rather than measuring informational complexity. At the same time, CASU can be used to visualize informational complexity. So this is the simple mode of the program. In it, we have the five main parameters of informational complexity. So they are density, the number of object types, their relative abundance, the variability and range in their dimensions, as well as the spatial arrangement. So by tweaking the sliders here, you'll see the changes being reflected here. An advanced mode was also built into the program to help us create actual substrates. So for example, the output files from CASU are optimized for uh, Excel and CAD software so that we can produce 3D models or actual concrete tiles. So the software and software manual is now freely available to download on PLOS One. Um, and with it, I can then create tiles of different levels of complexity while controlling for surface area. And that's the aim of my first experiment, that is to see if complex tiles will really enhance biodiversity more than simple ones of the same surface area. And the second aim of my first experiment was to look at the effect of the type of structure itself that is basically to find out what are the best designs. To do this, I used an earlier version of CASU to create concrete tiles of two different levels of complexity, simple and complex. So each full tile consists of four quarter tiles, each with a different structural component. They are pits, towers, grooves, and ducts. And, with, um, and more importantly, they all have approximately equal surface area. So the output files from CASU were used to create these AutoCAD drawings. And the AutoCAD drawings were used to create the aluminum masters from which plastic molds and concrete tiles were cast. Granite controls were also created. Um, the granite controls are used uh, simply to mimic the background seawall as a basis of comparison. To create, give us um, a total of three tile types, simple, complex, in the granite control. The tiles were installed at two sites south of the mainland of Singapore. They are Pula, at Pola Hantu and Kusu Island. With eight replicates of each tile type installed along two tidal heights at those two sites, uh, we created a three-way ANOVA design consisting of 96 full tiles or 384 quarter tiles. The tiles were photographed monthly and after 13 months, all the tiles were successfully retrieved and all the organisms on them were sorted, counted and identified. So LD were identified to a functional group level and the animals to species or morphospecies level. And then the data were analyzed. So based on the species data only, that's a total of 54,000 individuals representing 70 different species or morphospecies we found that indeed complex tiles supported greater species richness at the low shore position independently of area. So this is the results at each site. 
as you can see, at the low shore position, the three tile types were significantly different. And the pattern is also true at the high shore position, although there are less organisms there due to a greater degree of air exposure. Uh, granite controls were also significantly, had significantly lower species richness as well as abundance uh, compared to the simple and complex tiles. Community composition was also significantly different among the three tile types. As you can see from the cat plot here, assemblages responded to the effects of increased size variability at the 4 to 28 mm scale. I also found that the type of structure can have an effect on species richness that is independent of their complexity. In other words, that pits, towers and grooves were the best designs in terms of capturing the greatest number of species. The type of structure can also have an effect on community composition that is independent of complexity. Um, you can see here from the cat plot that the granite tiles are significantly different to those on the com uh, concrete tiles. And based on this, these results, I picked the two best designs. So based on the two best designs, that's the pits and the grooves, I doubled the size of the tile from 20 by 20 cm to 40 by 40 cm to test the effect of changing the scale of structural manipulation. And I also um, examined the wave properties over the various tile designs uh, in addition to this spill experiment. So with five, rep five replicates of each tile type installed at the same two sites, but along one tidal height this time, uh, we created a total of 50 tiles. And I split this up into two experiments. So experiment two is based on the monitoring work done over a year, while experiment three is based on the data collected at the end of one year. So I'll just very quickly go through experiment two. Um, the tiles were photographed at each site for a period of a year, and from which I just analyzed patterns of algal succession. And there are just two main findings that I just want to highlight here, and that is that the succession trajectories of complex and simple tiles were very similar, and they were very different to what the granite tiles were able to support. So after a year, the tiles were sampled and all the organisms on them were identified and sorted and counted again. So now we are on to the results of experiment three. And similar to the first study, I found that complex tiles generally supported greater species richness compared to simple tiles suggesting that the expanded size range that we tested here remained relevant to the intertidal communities at the sites we tested. So in the previous study, I looked at the 4 to 28 mm scale. In this study, I looked at the 8 to 56 mm scale. So now we know that complexity operates at this scale. I also found that community compositions was significantly different among the tile types and that the assemblages um, supported by the granite tiles were highly distinct, similar to the complementing the results of the succession study. And that concrete tiles were compositionally better differentiated along the second cap axis here by the type of structure, that is by the pits, the grooves, and the pits. So in order to assess if there were any small-scale hydrodynamic differences that could explain these upscale results, I also conducted a series of flume experiments to measure the three-dimensional flow velocities across the surfaces of each tile type. And the results suggest that this is unlikely as the wave hydrodynamics across the surfaces of all the tile types, including the controls, were very similar. So in all these experiments show that it is possible to increase biodiversity on seawalls using concrete tiles molded with complex designs. However, as it's um, not practical or even economical to cover existing seawalls with tons of concrete, if we are going to retrofit tiles on seawalls, we need to find out what's the best density and spatial arrangement in which we can do so. So the, while the impetus of this final study um, is applied, um, it also represents a good opportunity for us to look at the independent and interactive effects of density and fragmentation, which strictly speaking refers to just the configurational effects. So this is rarely tested in the field because the process of fragmentation 
is often accompanied by the process of habitat loss, making it very difficult to control for both at the same time. Which explains um, why there's a great reliance on theoretical models, despite reported discrepancies between actual and predicted species loss. So to do this, I created a 3 by 3 matrix uh, to test the independent and interactive effects of density and fragmentation. So here we have increasing fragmentation. Here we have increasing density. SL refers to single large, SS to several small, and lot to lots of tiny. So if you're familiar with the famous loss debate in conservation biology, this looks at loss lot. So effectively, each plot here is a replicate, and within each plot, each black pixel is a tile on the seawall, which represents the surrounding matrix. So this is how a plot looks like on the seawall. This is one replicate plot. To create four replicates of those nine plot configurations I showed earlier, required the installation of 720 tiles along the parameter of one of the island site we tested before. So the tiles were created using CASU to generate the levels of complexity based on the random arrangement of both pits and grooves um, and making use of the expanded size range we uncovered from the second experiment. So this, this is how the tiles were made and after a year the entire plots were sampled including the tiles and the background seawall. So the results uh, revealed that indeed there was both independent and interactive effects of density and fragmentation. And in particular, uh, there are four really interesting findings. First, that plots with a uh, greater number of tiles supported greater species richness, but generally plots with 20 and 30 tiles did not significantly differ. Second, plots with tiles arranged in the several small configuration hosted greater species richness compared to plots in the single large configuration. Although lot didn't perform as well as the single, uh, several small, um, it did surprisingly well in general. And lastly, um, the effect of fragmentation was not present on plots with only 10 tiles. So this is useful for applied purposes because it shows that when you have too little tiles, it doesn't even matter how you arrange them. So it would appear that based on this study, installing 20 tiles would be as effective as installing 20 tiles, uh, at, as 30 tiles. That's 21% cover and 14% cover. Therefore, the ideal combination or the most cost-effective approach to retrofitting tiles on seawalls, at least for in Singapore at this site, is to have a 14% cover, that's 3.5 tiles per meter square, with an intermediate level of fragmentation. To better understand these experimental results, I'm also currently investigating several hypotheses about the mechanisms underpinning the observed diversity patterns. For example, I'm using simulation models to test if such patterns can be generated by the effect of dispersal limitation. So in from an applied perspective, the next step, of course, would be to integrate, incorporate all the, all, our, all the knowledge gained from this research into an integrated tile design for larger scale testing and deployment. And also to test the global applicability of our designs um, to see how it works elsewhere. And this is part of the reason I'm here. And I was uh, in the field at Blackness just a couple of weeks ago uh, to look at my tiles in the UK, which is currently part of uh, Dr. Larissa Naylor's uh, group's um, wide-scale uh, trials in the UK, testing not only my designs, but um, some of her, her designs and her students' designs. We also have an upcoming grant uh, in Singapore to continue this area of research. For example, we hope to work with material scientists uh, as well as hydrodynamic engineers to uh, explore the hydrodynamics on and around seawalls, as well as to test out different materials um, uh, and how it affects biofilm as well as succession and, and colonization. 
hopefully all this will help to um, us better understand seawalls as a system, which I think is a fantastic test bit for many different ideas about ecological theory in general, um, as well as lead to new technologies that will um, increase the value of seawalls as a habitat. So with that, I would like to thank um, these people and organizations for their support, um, for supporting my work over the last four years, um, as well as I would like to especially thank MAST and, and um, Dr. Dr. Naylor for supporting my being here and, and um, the MAST Pika Fellowship. Yep. Thank you very much. brilliant example of timing and organization and a phenomenal amount of uh, coverage in a very short, concise period, but very nicely delivered. Are there any questions? Because Lynette's left us a little bit of time. That's absolutely lovely and multidisciplinary work. Thank you. And we've got two questions. The first is, what sort of person are you? Are you a mathematician? Or, you <laughs> or what? Um, marine ecologist by training and maybe dabbling in all sorts of other things um, due to the circumstance of this type of project. Dabbling. <laughs> um, I suppose the biological question is, and it kind of links to the presentation that's going to come up next, with regard to jellyfish, we see that in regions where there's lots of man-made structures, you get lots more jellyfish polyps, and it's hypothesized that that might lead to jellyfish blooms. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you've got any information on kind of exotic species that might be preferentially lodging onto your tiles than kind of a natural assemblage that might previously have been there? This is a, quite a common question. People usually wonder whether there are um, invasive species that might be troublesome. So uh, um, there is this um, ecology letters paper, I think, um, I don't know if I should say this. <laughs> Um, ecology, uh, ecology Letters paper, a quite recent one that was published um, based on modeling work that Singapore would be, basically the, the study found lists Singapore as the top in terms of the amount of invasive it would, because of its shipping connections and stuff like that. And what, based on what we know, that we, we actually, aren't, we actually um, don't have um, that much as, as in fact, we are actually quite low in, in terms of, because we have a invasion biologist in, um, in the department and he's published the paper on, and, you, and it doesn't match up with what, what it was predicted. Okay. So that's really strange. And we, have an, we had an honor student also, her, her mission was to go out and find invasive species on seawalls and she couldn't find any after a year of basically haphazardly looking around and, and she couldn't find so, and what based on the the species list that I have, um, I didn't notice any species that were particularly um, problematic. Yeah. Just following that, um, how were you exclusively intertidal, or were any of your tiles placed just subtitle? Exclusively intertidal. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't feeling already slightly challenged by the next generation. I would note that I think that's a painting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which makes it feel even worse. Can I ask a, another question? In terms of the biodiversity you're finding, what, one thing you haven't related it back to is the natural biodiversity of those systems. Um, have you done any comparison to say, you know, what kind of functionality you can uh, preserve against what would be there in nature? Um, actually, this study was conducted by Samantha right there. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of her master's project, um, we were in the same lab for a period and now she's moved on to something else. Um, <laughs> so basically what she found was that seawalls um, host a subset of what is um, already present on natural rocky shores. And in, because, as I said, that tropical rocky shore is just very understudied, mm. we, don't really, we, we don't really have quanti like proper data on the function and, and you know. Uh, so you can't do BTA, you don't have traits analysis or? No, no. yeah. <laughs> I mentioned your work to a coastal engineer and he said he'd have two questions and he'd be interested in the value of it, how much that was in comparison to a regular seawall 
because all he saw was it was going to be more expensive, basically. And, um, and that would be hugely prohibitive. But he also said, what about its wave refraction? That would be really important to them. Yeah. Was it going to be better at absorbing wave energy compared to a regular seawall? Because that's the big issue they have. I think that's part of the reason why we work, need to work with proper engineers. You do. Because yeah. the expertise is just beyond me and I have I, I can't answer in relation to wave refraction. Yeah. yeah. But I would think that cost wise, you know, if it was part I mean in I think in any in in the case of adopting any new uh, design at the beginning, cost-wise, is of course more than what so you will have. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Then the established. You use uh, granite as your control. That yeah. Would be hugely cost prohibitive. They're all concrete. Yeah. yeah. But in Singapore, the typical seawall you have is the granite rip wrap style. Oh, yeah. 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 And yeah. I'm thinking more about your built structures. <clears throat> yeah, I realize That's that. What they're replacing. Kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 It's Jobbing engineers very yeah. interested in but it. But we, we are, we have, um, in the upcoming grant, mm -hmm. we are working with uh, engineers to, to look at this aspect. So hopefully I can answer your question in a few years. <laughs> Any final question before we switch over? I was just wondering, so in terms of the control, the control was granite and the structures were concrete. The concrete. Is there any issue on kind of the effect of the actual um, material itself. For sure, I, I think, diversity. yeah, but um, for sure I think that the material is like granite, for example, is so much less porous than, than concrete. And I'm sure the weathering of granite versus concrete is also vastly different. But um, it was simply just to um, mimic what the background seawall is like. So, you know, if we are talking about enhancement, we need to show that this is, yeah, is, is yeah, no, it's just interesting in terms of the complexity, I guess, in terms of the comparison against concrete. Oh, I did measure the, the surface area of my control. They're mm -hmm. actually slightly, I mean, because I can't obviously control for the surface area, for the controls, but um, they're more or less the same, but they have slightly greater surface area. Mm -hmm. than, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very thank much you. indeed for that great talk.